And so uh, it seemed to me, uh, looking at this data as a technologist and as an investor in is Israeli and American companies, I've written four or five books about technology, uh, that uh, Israel is not a uh, charity, as some people seem to imply. It is not, uh, uh, we should not support Israel merely because it happens to be a democracy. There are a lot of democracies in the world, not enough. Uh, but uh, we support Israel because Israel is an absolutely vital support for us. And, uh, and I believe that uh, all of American foreign policy and, and uh, a lot of our def defense strategies are distorted because we fail to recognize that Israel is really an extension of Silicon Valley, which is the heart of the U.S. economy and makes possible uh, U.S. leadership and wealth in the world. And uh, this is... Uh, and, and when we, so any reasonable view of, uh, view of the Middle East that fails to recognize this fact is, is, is going to lead to distorted uh, policies which are incoherent and can't be effectively defended. Um, you know, the reason to overthrow Saddam, there's only one reason in my view that really defined the evil of Saddam that uh, proved that he had to be overthrown. And that was that he was paying families in Palestine to $25,000 to send their tied bombs around their kids and send them into Israel and to buses and cafes. He was paying the suicide bombers. That is that is a, a outrageous international violation and abuse of any moral standard in the world. And it also directly attacked our most valuable ally and economic uh, collaborator in the world economy. And that's why we attack Iraq. That makes sense. So uh, this is the... Uh, and, and today, uh, if the problem with, if to me in the Middle East, why, it's such, why our policies seem incoherent is that uh, we're afraid to say the reason we're there is because Israel is absolutely vital to the United States. It's a crucial ally. And, if, and we don't oppose uh, uh, Muslims. We don't oppose... Uh, uh, Arabs or Iranians or anything. We defend Israel and if you uh, want to attack Israel you're going to have to deal with us. And uh, understanding that our own uh, defense capabilities, 600 key components in the F-16 fighter jet, the drones and predators that are critical to our operations in the region, all have crucial is Israeli components. So, um, but it's worth also understanding that the greatest, that the U.S. is a tremendous beneficiary of Israel, but, but an even greater beneficiary really are the Palestinians. The Palestinians, you know, I've, I've, I always want to understand the views of my opponents better than they do before I uh, launch a, a book. So I have piles and piles of these books about the uh, grievances of the Palestinians. It's, it's baffling and amazing. Uh, it's, it's, it's just uh, these academic, it's an academic industry. And there's, there's virtually no validity in it, except to the extent that uh, when uh, you start uh, adopting terrorist policies, uh, you're going to have your uh, opponents are going to respond. That's the only uh, that's the key fact in the Middle East is that uh, is that uh, Israel's enemies there have have never given up their 
threat to destroy the country. That's the problem. And you can't have a state uh, established that's based on a movement which is defined by its uh, dedication to the destruction of, of Israel. But uh, the reason I'm very optimistic is because Israel's strength uh, compared to all its enemies is steadily growing uh, year by year and day by day. And so as time passes, it's going to be increasingly evident to anybody in the Middle East that if they want to prosper, they're going to have to collaborate with Israel and trade with Israel and work with Israel in a civilized pattern of global capitalism in the, as the model comes. And, the reason, and this is not mere uh, uh, dream, it's history. Uh, between 1967 and 1987, or 1967 and 1990 really, uh, the Israelis ran the West Bank and Gaza. And it was rather a bad time in Israel. Israel was still in a slough of socialism. And the West Bank and Gaza were kind of the wild east for uh, Israel. And, and 250,000 settlers moved into uh, uh, these territories during this period. And it's often said in all that pile of books that there was a lot of displacement going on. But uh, uh, the, during this period, the Arab population tripled. So, so uh, how could there have been displacement? All those books could just be thrown into the wastebasket uh, just on the basis of the obvious demographic figures. Even if you knew that while the Arab population tripled, their per capita incomes also tripled, per capita. And their life expectancies rose from 40 years to 70 years. They had 261 new towns established, usually close to the Israeli settlements because they chiefly were moving in to take advantage of the prosperity that the Israelis were created, creating. There were seven new universities established. There was uh, just endless development. Gaza grew even faster than the West Bank, the 20-fold increase in incomes in Gaza. This was a golden age for the Palestinians. And, and this was panic and horror for the PLO. And, and uh, the PLO was becoming utterly irrelevant. And this terrified them. And so they went to all the gullible, um, useful idiots in the United Nations and, uh, else, and in Washington, and they got Arafat uh, brought in from Tunisia to take over uh, Palestine. And uh, Arafat and a team of thugs, of really, who, who were inspired by Nazism and anti-Semitism and hated Israel. And, and that, but uh, that was, and they gave them billions of dollars of foreign aid. And that was the first Israel test that the world fatally and, and dreadfully failed. Today we face another challenge, another Israel test, and we cannot fail it. Thank you.